so we're actually, you know, I know everyone's here for some fun, so I don't want to be too much of a downer and talk about work, but uh, I thought I'd just talk, just spend a few minutes running through uh, some of the commercial applications and, and what our strategy is for commercialization of Earth Engine. Um, so hopefully by now you've realized the power of Earth Engine and being able to have basically access to Google's cloud uh, and access to all this great geospatial data, including Landsat and MODIS and NAEP and all these other great sources, uh, and being able to run that at a scale that has never really been possible before. Um, and you know, I think many of the people in this room uh, have contributed to you know, a lot of these great case use cases, and I expect to see a lot more in the coming year um, as you sort of unleash your own research and your own uh, ideas uh, using our technology. Um, but it turns out that there's actually uh, you know, other applications beyond just research and public benefit um, and educational applications. Um, and if you just look at kind of some of the core use cases that we've been focusing on, forest cover and class, uh, land classification, uh, which has been used for deforestation alerting and carbon emission reduction. That's also really useful for, for RED Plus, uh, which is an economic framework for compensating um, countries to basically not degrade their forests. Um, obviously, in just general forestry management, uh, wildlife management, uh, agriculture, there's you know, a lot of different commercial use cases where that technology is really important. Um, likewise, in earthquake and uh, flood modeling, um, this obviously helps with disaster response and, and uh, climate mitigation but is also really valuable to insurance and reinsurance companies because they need to know what kind of risk is actually involved. Uh, if someone's gonna be moving, you know, building a new factory in a location, what is the, the flood risk? And you know, that data exists in a lot of modern industrialized nations, but it doesn't exist in many places in the world. And so you know, companies need to understand what kind of risks they're facing and how do I, they address those risks. Uh, in, in water and evapotranspiration, obviously it's very valuable for, for drought and food security, but it's also really key for agriculture. Um, precision agriculture, water utilities, and, and you know, many, many people, in fact, one could say all of us, depend on water um, and knowing how much we have and how much we're gonna have in the future. Uh, and finally, on infectious disease prediction, you know, obviously for public health, but there's a lot of uh, foundations and, and others who are interested in, in basically paying for having these kind of capabilities. Um, and you know, the list goes on and on. I, can, I could talk for hours about all the different things that the geospatial industry is doing, but I'm sure you're well aware of, of different ways that this technology could be applied. And we see Earth Engine as, as one of those great differentiators that could really revolutionize industry in the same way that it, I think it's uh, revolutionized um, academia and, and, and remote sensing. Just a, a couple of example cases. Um, this is an East Bay water, uh, water district. Uh, if you're not from California, you have probably heard um, we're having a drought. Um, water is a huge issue for us right now. So this is an example. We've been working with a local utility to basically do land classification and come up with an evapotranspiration model for how much water they expect any given customer to use. And then they can compare that. They have a meter so they can say, okay, well, how much, how much are they actually using? And can start to identify who are the outliers, you know, is there water theft happening? Um, just to get a better idea of, of how water is being consumed and what they can do to really uh, reduce water. You know, they had, this is actually last year, they had this notion of 20% reduction by 2020. Um, that has very quickly become 25% reduction by 2015. Uh, and it may go further than that, depending on how the, the drought plays out. Uh, another example, Nico was talking about using skybox imagery for doing economic uh, assessment. There's a, a local startup called Spaceno that's actually doing this with Landsat data, looking at industrial output in China, um, and looking at basically different factories and and starting to you know, learn what you can by looking at different pixels over time to, to measure economic activity. And, and one of the products they're looking at is a, basically a product for the um, finance industry for future, you know, the futures of economic output in China. Uh, just running through a couple other ones, uh, True Green is a company that does lawn care. Uh, you know, they want to know how much lawn is there out there, or if a particular customer calls, how much lawn area are they going to have, and if we want to provide a quote for, for maintenance of that, what should that quote look like? 
Uh, Ernest and Julio, uh, Julio Gallo is a winery. Um, they care a, a lot about water, and they want to be able to get information about water into the hands of their growers, both the ones that are uh, you know, directly employed by Gallo, as well as the third-party network of growers that uh, supply grapes to them. Um, MDA is an example of a company that uh, builds lots of different data products. Um, they use Landsat, they use uh, um, RapidEye and other sources to build, you know, for example, soil type. Um, they provide uh, data sets to the US government. Uh, the Postal Service is interested in knowing where do you deliver postage to rural areas. Like a lot of these maps and data that people have are really, really old and they want to get updated information of like where is there a rural, you know, where is the entrance to a, a house and what does the road look like into that house. Um, there's just an infinite number of different ways that you can imagine uh, being able to analyze imagery um, and use that to improve uh, business operations. So um, as we talk about commerce and, and what this all means, I'm going to dive a little bit into our terms. And um, I want to start by saying I am not a lawyer and I'm not here to give you legal advice. Um, but with that caveat, uh, let's look at some, some parts of our terms. So one of the questions is what can you do today? Right? So you as users of Earth Engine uh, have accepted our terms and this is part of using Earth Engine. And basically what this is saying is you can use it for development, evaluation, research, or educational purposes. And if you want to use it in a commercial environment, you can basically test it out in a commercial environment, but you can't deploy it commercially. Um, and that's kind of the, the current state of affairs. Um, another thing in our terms as we're kind of rummaging through legal language um, is there's a lot of questions that come up around intellectual property, right? And it's like, you know, if you're in the research community, um, you may be more likely to, to share that, your IP out with the rest of the world, but as you start gaining into the commercial area, um, that becomes even a, a greater concern in terms of ownership and, and what do you own and what does Google own. Um, I'm not, there's a lot of legal words here, I'm not gonna read this, but basically, you know, your IP is your IP and your content is your content and you own that, right? And the only rights that Google really needs to that is the rights we need to actually operate the service. Um, if anyone has actually looked at the terms, you might have noticed this strange thing where in the recent signup flow, there's this thing called Maps Engine, and you're signing up for Maps Earth Engine, but it has all this Maps Engine language in there, and it's like, what's going on? Um, as it turns out, last year, we were really working on integrating Earth Engine with one of our commercial products we called Maps Engine, and so we were starting this process of kind of consolidating the legal language and a lot of the other product factors. Um, and then what happened was we decided to not move forward with the Maps Engine product. Uh, and that's actually being uh, deprecated at the end of this year. Um, and so we're going to fix that because obviously Earth Engine is not going away. And this is something that we are very committed to. Our team has grown, uh, the impact continues to grow. I think hopefully you can see by you know, these kind of user conferences, this is something that is, is really important to us. Um, and we wanna make sure that people understand that when they come to the product page. So we're gonna be updating our terms to make it clear that, that these are Earth Engine terms, it's not part of this product that's going away, because I think some people out there have been sort of saying, oh yeah, Earth Engine's gonna go away, and, and that's just not true. Um, the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start allowing commercial access on a select case-by-case -case basis. We're still working on what are the longer term plans look like, and, and what would a commercial product look like, and how would we charge for that, and uh, all the things that go along with making a commercial service. But that's gonna take some time, and we recognize that people are gonna to wanna to start trying this in actual commercial applications and not run into this restriction uh, that are in our terms. So basically on a case-by-case -case basis, we're going to evaluate uh, whether or not a particular use case is appropriate. Uh, and that also includes you know, making sure that it matches well with what the capabilities of Earth Engine are. Um, especially around things like how much load you're gonna put on the system, and you know, we wanna make sure that people aren't going to uh, be unhappy if they're starting to use this as part of a, a commercial environment and that we're able to support that specific use case and that it's sort of within the, the constraints of our product which is you know, still being evolved and doesn't have service level agreements and, and things like that. Um, speaking of service level agreements, you know, unlike uh, other Google commercial products, uh, we don't have a service level agreement that comes with this that we're contractually bound to. Um, there isn't gonna be explicit support um, but as you, hopefully you all know, we have a very vibrant community. Uh, we have a great forum. There's lots of resources out there. 
Um, and if you're using this in a commercial context, we're still there for you and we're still going to help in every way we can. It's just there's not a contractual uh, service uh, support. And then there's no charge for that, right? So as we're starting to figure out what does this model look like and, and you know, how do we figure out how to start charging for the, the commercial applications, again, the, the, the nonprofit and educational and other use cases will continue to be uh, free and available as part of our service, but as we start thinking about the, the ones that are outside of those terms, um, that's gonna also take some time. So um, basically, if you're interested and you think you have a commercial use case, um, send me email, uh, pbirch at google.com. And basically, I, I, you know, we already have uh, partners lining up who are, who are interested in kind of taking that next step. Um, I'm actually working on, you know, working with our legal team to get the process in place to basically remove that language of commercial strict for uh, these partners that we think um, have good use cases. And um, if you think you have one and you want to learn more, just fire me an email. Um, just real quickly, what, what's your thinking around educational uses or research-based uses that start off as research-based but may then eventually roll into a commercial application? Um, if that wasn't the target initially, how, how would you deal with that? Yeah, so I mean, hopefully you all heard that, but it's a question of what about educational and other use cases that sort of evolve into commercial use cases. And I think that that could be true in any of the situations. It could be true in a research situation. Like anything you could be working on could potentially evolve into some type of commercial application. And that's why we want to start looking at this is because we do recognize that, you know, there may be cases where, you know, you're doing this purely in an in educational environment, but then you want to be able to actually start a company or go, you know, work on, you know, sell this as a, a service. And um, that's why we want to start bringing in this um, commercial capability. So if you do have a use case like that, uh, again, as you're starting to use it under the existing terms, you're fine. Um, and if you're starting to think about other use cases that you think might be commercial, uh, let us know. And we can kind of walk through what the, the next steps might look like and whether your use case is a good uh, use case for this this sort of trial period. Uh, yeah, you mentioned um, insurance and reinsurance. Um, I was just wondering how much interaction you've had with the kind of market. There's a, there's a lot of movement at the moment in insurance towards uh, platforms. There's lots of platforms emerging that allow you to kind of integrate hazard and exposure data and things. Um, have you have you had a lot of kind of uh, interaction with them? And is that something you kind of you, you're aiming to do? Um, yeah, we have. In fact, uh, Christian, who was called out earlier, who was standing over here, has been kind of our main point of contact with kind of the disaster and crisis response size, which is also include, included the insurance industry. So we've talked to players in that space, and they, they obviously see a business opportunity there as well. Um, and yes, there are obviously existing solutions out there, but again, what Earth Engine is bringing to the table is this ability to run very large scale analyses very quickly, right? And that's something that just isn't really possible in the existing kind of platform space. Um, and that's where we really see our opportunity is being able to, you know, if it's taking you three months to, to do the analysis to figure out the risk profile, if you could do that in a week, that could really change how you think about insurance. All right. All right. Thanks very much.